Welcome to Distance Learning brought to you by the Palm Beach County School District Office of African, African American, Latino, Holocaust, and Gender Studies. Today's lesson is part two of the modern civil rights movement. For this lesson, you will need to access the African American history lesson plans located on the school district of Palm Beach County Google curriculum site. Within the lesson plans, you will find the materials that correspond to this lesson. If you joined us last week, I talked about three defining moments during the civil rights movement. Brown versus the Board of Education, which challenged the separate but equal precedent established by Plessy versus Ferguson and resulted in the US Supreme Court ruling that separate but equal was unconstitutional in education. We took a brief look at the impact of the Emmett Till lynching on African-American society and how the Montgomery bus boycott brought about a new way of resistance and led to the de desegregation of the Montgomery Alabama bus system as a result of precedent set by Brown versus Board of Education. The purpose of today's lesson is to continue to examine the first 10 years of the modern civil rights movement and its role in transforming the legal and social status of African Americans. Let's begin by activating your prior knowledge. How did the modern civil rights movement transform the legal and social status of African Americans? Take a moment to reflect. As I mentioned in the previous lesson, the resistance during the civil rights movement did not happen by chance. It was strategically planned and executed. There were more participants than Dr. King and Rosa Parks. Another misconception of the civil rights movement is that those involved were older adults. Dr. King was 26 years old when he joined the Montgomery Improvement Association and Rosa Parks was 43 when she resisted on a Montgomery bus. This leads to what we're going to discuss next, the role of youth in the movement. So in addition to the children who faced angry crowds during school desegregation, such as Ruby Bridges and the Little Rock Nine, youth were very much a part of the civil rights movement. College students participated in nonviolent sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, and Atlanta. Due to Jim Crow laws, Blacks were not allowed to use the same facilities or public places as whites. Woolworths, a popular department store, would allow Blacks to shop, but they were not allowed to sit, receive service, or eat at the counter. Four young men who were students of North Carolina Agricultural and Techno Technical College wanted to join the fight for equality. They planned a sit-in. The students entered the store February 1st, 1960 as shoppers, then proceeded to sit at the lunch counter. They were refused service and asked to leave. They sat until the store closed and returned the next day. More students joined them. Angry mobs showed up to harass them. The protests influenced students to take part in sit-ins at other establishments in various cities. The Greensboro sit-in would last until July 25, 1960. These actions would lead to the development of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, a student-led civil rights organization initiated by Ella Baker. The Freedom Riot was an effort in 1961 to desegregate interstate buses and trains. Integrated buses of activists 
traveled from Washington, D.C. to Louisiana and from Tennessee to Alabama. The passengers on these buses were met with an ugly, harsh, violent crowd of whites who resisted what was going on in the South. During one of the, the rides, a group of Freedom Riders were traveling to Mississippi and were arrested. Another bus was bombed. By the end of the summer, 300 Freedom Riders were arrested. John Lewis, a civil rights activist who would later become a United States representative, participated in the Freedom Rides and was an active member of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement faced challenges. The Albany movement began in the summer of 1961. The goal of the movement was desegregation. This movement was seen as a failure. The police chief in Albany, Georgia was familiar with the tactics that activists used. He instructed his police force to avoid engaging in violence in order to avoid the intervention of the federal government as a result, the Albany movement did not get the attention of the federal government. This movement was seen as a failure by King. The Birmingham confrontation lost momentum as well, but caught the attention of the federal government due to the children's crusade. After the March on Washington, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church and President Kennedy's assassination his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was a federal law banning discrimination in places of public accommodation. The Council of Federated Organizations, along with other civil rights organizations, focused their attention on registering Black voters. The goal was to register voters. African Americans were harassed, threatened, and discriminated against for exercising their right to vote. The Council of Federated Organizations asked white college students to help with voter registration efforts. The first day of the Freedom Summer, the first day of the Freedom Summer, three activists vanished and were later found dead. In 1964, the Mississippi Democratic Party met at the Democratic Party National Convention. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which consisted of 64 Blacks and four Whites, selected its own delegates to participate. They wanted to be seated as representatives for their state. Fannie Lou Hamer, co-founder and vice chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, testified to the convention about the injustices she experienced in Mississippi. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was offered two at-large seats at the convention, which they rejected, but their efforts were not forgotten. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act passed, which banned the methods that has systematically excluded African-Americans from registering or voting in Southern elections. This was a major accomplishment during the modern civil rights movement. Important points to remember. As I mentioned previously, the civil rights movement was a movement that was strategically and methodically planned and executed. Participants in the movement were not passive. Although some of the activists followed King's philosophy of nonviolence, some activists felt something should be done to protect Black people. In this week's lesson, you will learn about the Deacons of Defense and Justice, the Deacons for Defense and Justice, a group of Black men who were World War II and Korean War veterans. They practiced self-defense. They provided security for Blacks who wanted to register to vote, as well as white civil rights workers. You will also learn about Robert F. Williams, a civil rights leader who also act, act, advocated
for self-defense and organized self-defense groups to protect the freedom riders. The civil rights movement brought about new methods of protest, new laws that transformed the social legal status of African-Americans and a new reality of a prolonged fight for equality. This concludes part two of the civil rights movement. Next week, we will discuss the black power movement as you reflect on today's lesson, think of three things you've learned, two things you would like to learn more about, and one question you still have. Thank you for listening. <laughs>